Hi, uh, I'm Akif, and I'm going to be talking about binary search. Uh, I want to start this video off with a bit of an embarrassing confession. I actually didn't know how to properly implement the binary search uh, until I was already candidate master, until I was purple and code forces. Um, despite like the simplicity and elegance of binary search at a conceptual level, uh, the implementation of it can be very tricky and have a lot of uh, subtle edge cases and pitfalls. And I don't want you guys to go through that same thing. Uh, so in this video, I'm going to discuss a particular style of binary search called invariant binary search, uh, which avoids a lot of these edge cases um, and tricky points. Um, and in my opinion, it's very intuitive to understand. So first, I want to formalize what the goal of binary search is. Um, so we have some function, f of x, that maps from the integers to booleans, so from integers to true or false. Um, this is known as the predicate function. Um, informally, we often call it the works function. Okay. Um, and this function needs to have a specific property called monoticity. Um, and so when I say that a function is monotone here, uh, in this case, it means that it starts out always false, and then at some point it switches over to true, and then it becomes true forever. So you can see the picture over here. Uh, it's always false, red means false, and then it becomes true. Um, you can also have the opposite thing, where it's always true, and then it switches over and becomes always false forever. Um, so if we have some function like this, uh, the goal of binary search is to efficiently find this switchover point. So by switchover point, I mean here, when it goes from true to false, or false to true. Okay. Um, for example, if you consider the classic application of binary search to search in an array, whether an array contains an element x or not, um, you can think of this following predicate, where f of i equals ai less than equal to x. So uh, the, uh, the predicate function is just whether or not that array element at that position is less than equal to or greater than our uh, target value. So you can think that the array will always be less than equal to x, our target value, up till some point, and it'll become bigger than it. Um, so it satisfies monoticity. Um, and that switchover point where it goes from less than equal to to greater than, that's where you'll find um, our, our target value x if it exists. So you, you can see how uh, this function sort of understanding of binary search also uh, applies to our usual uh, binary search of searching in an array. Okay. Um, so the critical idea behind invariant binary search is that we have two pointers, a left pointer and a right pointer. Um, and one of these starts out in a position where the predicate is always true there. And the other pointer starts out at a position uh, where the predicate is always false. Okay. Um, so like in the picture over here, we have the left one in the red zone um, and the right one in the green zone. And so the left one is false, the right one is true. Um, and you want to think about sliding these pointers to closer together. Okay. And you want to uh, shrink, have the region, region between them shrink. Um, and the super important part here is that we want to keep the left one in the red region and keep the right one in the green region. So as we shrink it, we keep the left one in the red region and the green one, in the, uh, the red one in the right, left one in the red region, and the green one, in the right one in the green region. Okay, we keep, keep, we do that uh, as we shrink it. Um, this is this is just for this example. In general, one of them, either the left or right, will start as red, and the other one will start as green. And whichever one started started as red has to stay in the red region, and whichever one started in the green region has to stay in the green region. Um, and so, the, the, as I said, the super important part is that this condition always stays true. So from the very beginning up till the very end, this condition that they stay in their respective regions has to stay true. Um, and this condition is the invariant that invariant binary research is named after. It's, it's always true, it's invariant that left pointer, for example, is in the red region and right pointer is in the green region. Okay. Um, and so if we keep doing this as we shrink the region um, until we can't shrink it anymore, so in, in this picture we can't shrink it anymore, then we have found the switchover point that we're looking for, right? So if, if, if you look here, uh, the, we found the switchover point because we can't shrink the region any further. They're exactly one apart. Um, and so if we're able to do this, if we're able to shrink while maintaining this invariant, then we can find the switchover point. Um, so uh, here's some pseudocode for the invariant binary search. You can see how simple it looks, which is really nice. So 
uh, let me show you some things about it. So first, th these L and R are your left and right pointers. Um, and L starts out at a position that is always red, that is always false. No matter what the specific case of your program is, you want to start L at a position that no matter what will always be false. And same, uh, you want to find start the right pointer off at a position that will always be true, always be green. Um, and this is to maintain the invariant. If the invariant, invariant isn't true in the very beginning, who knows if it'll be true uh, throughout the program. So you, at the beginning, you need to make sure that the invariant is satisfied. Uh, then you keep looping while you can. Well, you can't shrink the region any further. So if you see here, r minus l is greater than 1, that means you still have some room to shrink. You haven't found the border yet, the, the switchover point yet. And so while you can do that, uh, you find so the midpoint of the region. Okay, And if the midpoint of the region, so works is a predicate example. So if that midpoint of the region satisfies the predicate, if it gives true, um, then we set red uh, r equals to that midpoint, right? Because remember, r is always supposed to be true and left is always supposed to be false. So here, if this is if m is true, then we set r equals to true. And so we've had this this pointer here and this pointer here, and then we just move this pointer to the middle, and so we've shrunk the region like half. Um, otherwise, if that midpoint uh, fails, if it's false, then we set the left pointer to it because remember the left pointer is the one that always stays false. So in that case, we have a left pointer here, right pointer here, and we've moved the left pointer to the midpoint here because we know that midpoint is still in the red region. Okay. Um, some important points to note about this implementation. Uh, if you have uh, some experience with uh, sort of uh, more traditional binary search implementation methods, um, you may have uh, experience with uh, sort of having to deal with infinite loops at the end, or perhaps having to decide between uh, floor division or ceiling division, or maybe even having to like deal with off by ones where you have to do uh, is r equal to m or m plus one or is l or m l plus one or stuff like that, right? And the interaction between all those is very important to get right to make sure you don't have infinite loops, and it's really really annoying. Here, since l and r always stay at least one apart before you're done, or at least two apart before you're done, always greater than one apart, uh, you don't have to worry about any of that. The, the, the region will keep on shrinking when you divide by 2. Since, since L minus R is at least 2, right? Um, when you do M equals L plus R over 2, you'll always shrink it no matter what. So you don't have to worry about whether to do floor or ceiling division. Both of them work. There is no uh, off by one stuff at all, nothing like that. Um, and it just, just works until you reach the end and when they're one apart, which is really, really nice to think about and, and, and actually use. Um, the, the next thing uh, to, to realize is that in, in this, in the previous pseudocode, right, I had done it so that left is always red and green is, uh, right is green, and you have that, those sort of regions. Um, you can do the same thing, but where you flip it, where it starts out green, like here, and then goes to red. Uh, so L, L would be green and, and R would be red. And it's not m anything different, you just start the L and R initially off at the opposite way, and then you also flip the if statement also, because uh, if if uh, m fa passes the predicate, then you set it to l. Otherwise, you set r to it, and so that that's usually to flip those two things, and then it will be the exact same. Uh, the last thing to consider is that the original l and r values never get f called on them. You never actually operate on them in the loop, like the original values you set before. Th these original values, you never actually get works called on them. If you, uh, I'm not going to show why that's true here, but if you consider how the sort of how this sort of loop plays out. Um, no matter what, uh, these values are never going to get anything called on it. Um, so what that means is that uh, in the weird sort of case where uh, it's, if it's possible for f to always be green, or if it's possible for r to all for f to always be red, to always be false, um, that's okay. There is there isn't an issue because you can just so for example, uh, if um, if it's possible for it to always be green, right? Then you'd be like, oh, what value can I set for l? There is no value that's always red. But there is, you can just pick some random out of bounds value, like like past past that can actually exist, and just use that for your original L, and just pretend that it's always red, uh, even if it doesn't actually mean anything, because works will never be called on it, so you don't have to actually worry about what it actually is. Okay, we'll see more about that later. Um, so now let's consider the time complexity. I'm sure most of you have uh, are well aware of the time complexity of binary search, but I just want to go over it again. Um, so here we, uh, every time in uh, in the iteration of the in the while loop, we shrink um, either L or R to the midpoint of L and R. So that means that the range basically cuts in half every time. Um, and so this means that this has all log n time complexity, where n is like sort of the initial range of L and R. So it only takes log n of that, right? Um, and this is very very good. So if you have some a range, let's say starting at a size of a million, 
a, a log of that, so the amount of steps binary search will take, is only 20. So that's insanely good, right? Um, and this, this and it grows very, very even uh, even slower as you consider doing bigger values. For example, a billion is still only thirty, so very good uh, time complexity. Okay, um, now let's do an example. Uh, and so this is the the same example I mentioned on the first slide, which is searching for a value in an array. So we have some a sorted array, right? And we have um, some value x that we want to search for in that array. Okay. So as I said, we'll make the predicate be whether or not ai is less than or equal to x, right? Um, so at the very end, when we found the switchover point, we found the border, right? Then l, the l pointer, will be the last thing which is less than or equal to x, and then the right pointer will be the first thing where the predicate fails, which is the first thing greater than x, right? So here, as an example, if we search for eight, here this is the last thing that's less than or equal to eight, and this is the first thing that's greater than eight, you know, right? Right? Um, and so at the end, all we need to do to check whether or not uh, x is in the array or not, we need to check whether al is equal to x, whether the last thing less than equal to x is actually equal to x and not just less than a. Right? So here's some code for it. So we define this, func this function contains, which takes in an array, in, in array a, um, the length of the array n, and then the value we're searching for x. Okay? I'm going to return a boolean for whether or not it contains it. Okay? So this is the same setup we had from the pseudocode before, if you remember. So we start the L pointer at negative 1 and the R pointer at N. Okay? So you may say, what the heck, these values are out of bounds. Both negative 1 and N are a completely out of bounds array. How are you going to run the predicate on that? Um, and this is where the important point comes in, which I said that it's po the original L and R never get called. And in this case, um, it's possible for the entire array to be green or for the entire array to be red. Right? You can have everything be less than or equal to X. Or you can have everything be greater than x, right? Um, so to, for the original LNR to have values that we for sure are green and for sure are red, um, you need to go out of bounds. And so we set this negative one, and we set this one to, to n. So one out of bounds in each case, and we're, that's okay because, as I said, we'll never actually call the predicate on that. Okay? So then we have the normal while loop for while r minus l is greater than one, directly from the pseudocode. Uh, same thing here. We calculate m as a midpoint, and um, then here's a predicate. Here we check whether or not that the value at the current midpoint position is less than or equal to x. If it is, uh, we set L to it because then it works. If it works, right, we, this is this is the there are all greens on the left and then red on the right. So if it works, if it's green, then we set L to it because L is the one that's supposed to be green. And then otherwise, we set R to it because it's red. So then R is the one that's supposed to be red. Okay. Now when we're done, there's two things we need to do. First, we need to make sure that L isn't negative one. So if everything is red, right, then L will be negative 1, because everything is greater than x except for our special out-of-bounds value. So if that's the case, then we want to return false. So we make sure it's not negative 1, and um, the value at that array is actually, value at that position is actually equal to x, and not just less than it. And so if we do that, then that tells us whether or not uh, it contains it. And so in, in log n steps, we use a search and array for a value. And I just want to emphasize again, notice how unlike your normally binary search code, there's no plus one, no seal division, floor division, just no, no L equals M plus one if you consider, nothing like that. No infinite loops, very easy. Uh, okay. Okay, so next problem, okay? Uh, so this is square root, so we're given some integer x, and we want to find um, if there's some, if it has, a, if it's a perfect square, and uh, if so, what is its uh, square root, okay? So we're going to find some number a, such that a times a equals x. Um, so we'll make the predicate be m times m greater than x. So f of m equals, equals this. Um, and the idea is that for, for, for at some point, we want to see whether or not that number squared is greater than your target value or less than or equal to it. Okay? So then over here, if you look here, if we're searching for 25, right? Uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 will all have their squares be less than or equal to x. So they won't work. But then six, seven, eight, nine, so 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 on. Their squares will be greater than x, so they'll work. They'll be in the green region. Okay. So then after, at the end of the binary search, when you shrunk it down to the border, r will be the last thing with its, with will we say with the first thing with the square greater than x. So here, right? So six squared is greater than twenty five, and l will be the last thing with the square less than or equal to x. So five squared twenty five is less than or equal to twenty five. Okay. So let's look at some code. So we're finding the square root of x int squared x. Um, and so here, we start, uh, as, as I said before, L starts out in the red region, right? So L is always false. So we set it to zero because zero squared is never going to be greater than x. It can't because zero squared is zero. It can never be greater than any other uh, non-negative integer, right? So um, 
yeah, at worst case, it'll be equal to x, which is fine, uh, not greater than. Then r is in the green region, so we find uh, set r equals to x plus 1, because x plus 1 squared is always greater than x, right? Even, even when uh, x is 0 or 1 or something, it'll still be greater than x. Okay? So this is always starts out in the green region. Then we have a normal uh, binary search boilerplate from before, so the while loop, we get the midpoint, um, and then we put the predicate. So now if m times m is greater than x, then it works, it's in the green region, m is in the green region, so then r equals m. Otherwise, m is in the, the red region, and then l equals m. Now, when we're done, remember, r is the last thing with a square greater than x, and l will be the last thing with a square less than equal to x. So we just check whether or not l times l equals x. If, uh, that should be return l, sorry, that should be return l, not return m. Um, but if l times l is uh, equal to x, right, um, then that's a square root, and we've found it. Otherwise, it's going to be, l times l is going to be less than x, because remember, l has to be less than equal to x. L, L, L squared has to be less than equal to x. So otherwise, if it's not equal to x, then it's less than x, and x doesn't have an integer square root. It's not a perfect square. So it's a return negative 1 for that case. Okay. Um, finally, we're going to do, do a code forces problem um, on binary searching on the answer. So you guys like sort of have a feel for how to apply this binary search to actual code forces problems. Okay. Um, so this problem is called magic powder. Um, and in, in this problem, you have a recipe for cookies. Um, and this recipe has n ingredients, where n is around 10 to the fifth, okay, at, at worst. Um, and so you're given an array, ai, um, okay, a, an array a, um, and so you need ai, where ai is up to, let's say, 10 to the ninth uh, grams of the ith ingredient per each cookie. So, so to make a single cookie, you need a zero ingredients of the uh, grams of the first ingredient, and a one grams of the second ingredient, and so on. Um, and then, <coughs> Uh, you have bi grams of that ingredient at home currently, right? Uh, where again, bi can be up to 10 to the ninth. Um, also, you have k grams, where k can also be up to 10 to the ninth, grams of this magic powder, um, where this magic powder can substitute for any other ingredient. So one gram of magic powder can substitute one gram of any other ingredient, okay? It can like, transmute itself into any of the other ingredients, okay? Um, and so the question is, what's the most amount of cookies you can make? How many cookies can you make uh, at best? Okay. As an example, let's look at this. So our recipe uh, A will be 2, 1, 4. So you need 2 grams of the first ingredient, 1 gram of the second ingredient, and then 4 grams of the third ingredient. Um, and you have 11 grams of the first ingredient, 3 grams of the second ingredient, uh, and then 16 grams of the uh, third ingredient. And you also have 1 gram of magic powder. Um, and so, so it turns out the best you can do is make four gram, four cookies. Okay, and the way you do this is you put the magic powder on the second ingredient. You convert the magic powder into the second ingredient, um, and then so you will have eleven, four, and then sixteen, and then two times four is eight, which is less than ele eleven. Let's equal to eleven. Um, one times four is four, which is less than equal to three plus one is four. So the magic powder gave you the amount of the second ingredient you needed to make four cookies, and then four times four is sixteen, which fits also. So the uh, best you can make four cookies, you can't make any more. Okay? Uh, so at this point, I'm gonna, uh, you guys can should pause probably and at least spend a couple minutes thinking about the solution to this problem. Okay? Pause now. Okay, now here's the solution. Okay? So uh, as I sort of indicated before, the solution is to binary search on the answer. This is a very common sort of theme in code forces problems where you find you need to find the max or min uh, where some condition where some condition holes or some task is able to be done. Uh, the, the, uh, you often have to binary search on the answer. Okay. Um, and so if we know we're making M cookies, if we know we should try to make M cookies, okay, we know how much magic powder we'll use, right? Because um, if we know uh, if we're gonna make M cookies, then we know how much total uh, amount of ingredient one we need to use, and how much of, we, of ingredient two we need to use, and how much of ingredient three we need to use, and so on, across all cookies, right? And we also know how much we have, right? So to make up the difference, if we don't have enough, we need to use magic powder, the, and we know exactly how much magic powder we'll need. Right? And so the predicate is very simply just, do we have that much magic powder, right? Do we have enough magic powder to make that many cookies? Then L will be the last thing that works. So with a small amount of cookies, right, from the left, you'll be able to make that amount of cookies. You'll always be able to make it like zero cookies, for example, right? Um, and so this, the left side will be green, and then eventually you won't be able to make that many cookies because you'll run out of ingredients and magic powder. Right? Um, and so the right side will be red. Okay? So then L, after we've shrunk the thing and finished the binary research, L will be the last thing that works. right? And so R will be the first thing that doesn't work. So for example here, if we have 8 magic powder, right, 8 grams of magic powder, and this, these values are how much magic powder we need to make 
each amount of cookies. So zero cookies, one cookie, two cookies, three cookies, so forth. Um, then we'll be able to make this amount of cookies. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. We'll be able to make six cookies at, at, um, at best because for seven cookies, you need ten magic powder, which is more than what we have. Okay? So let's take some code. So we start out L at zero because, as I said, you'll always be able to make zero cookies no matter what, right? Um, and then I set R equals to this huge value, 3E9, because you'll never be able to make more cookies than that just because, like, you only have 10 and 9th of each ingredient. So I just, just sort of fudge it and make it bigger than you'll possibly need, right? Okay, this, then we do the while loop while we can shrink it. Uh, then we set the midpoint, right? And then now we're going to count up how much powder we'll need, okay? So we set particle zero, and then we loop over each ingredient, okay? So then we say, okay, um, we'll need AI times M uh, of this grams of this ingredient, right? Because AI per cookie, and we're making M cookies, right? But we have BI already, right? So that, how many we need, minus how much we have, tells us how much extra powder, how much extra we'll need to be made up by powder, right? But, and if, but if we have enough, if we have more than we need, right? Um, then we need that we don't want to use like negative powder. We want to max that out with zero. So we want to bottom it out zero. So we either we need we need zero powder or we actually need some amount of powder, right? So we do max zero there, okay? And then we add that to the total powder we need for this case. Um, oh, this this next line is just uh, just to stop overflow. Uh, so it, it turns out if we have like uh, ten and ninth cookies and ten and ninth of uh, powder we need and ten and the fifth that actually goes above ten to the eighteenth or ten to the nineteenth. Um, and so that's too much, and they'll actually overflow. Um, however, there's no point in counting powder past K plus 1. If we need more than K plus 1 powder, right, or more than K powder, then we're screwed no matter what, right? No matter how big. There's no point going bigger than that. So we just min it out with K plus 1, and we never let it go bigger than that, okay? Just to stop the uh, in overflow or long overflow, okay? So we do that. Um, now here, here's the predicate. So now if the powder is less than or equal to K, so if we have enough powder, then we're still in the green zone, so we set L equals to that. Otherwise, we're in the red zone, so we set R equals to that. And then finally, for the answer, the answer is just L, because it's the last thing that's in the green zone. So that's the max amount of cookies we can make. And so that's it. OK? Uh, so that's that. Um, so thanks for watching, guys. Uh, these slides are going to be in the info channel on Discord. It's the link to this, this whole folder. Um, our Code Forces group should have a contest on sorting and binary search type problems already. Um, yeah, um, and also you can search the Code Forces problem set uh, tab by the tag binary search in case you want to do more of these binary search set problems. Okay. Okay. Cool. Thanks for watching. Bye.